Hello, welcome, welcome. Just gonna give it a few more minutes for people to join us. Hello, hello. Hello, why don't we have people put their names and pronouns and where they are zooming in from, please. Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so happy to have everyone. Please do put your name, pronouns, and where you are zooming in from in the chat. Hello, can, I don't know how this works. Can you hear anyone? Yes, I can hear, <laughs> I can hear you, Janet. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, Hi, I'm, I'm, so quiet. I'm We're Janet. We're gonna music in a second, actually. Let's see if we can get some music. Oh, okay, I'm, Welcome, I'm Janet, Janet Shapiro. If, if you could put and your name in the I'm, chat, I'm, Janet, if you have access to the chat. Oh. Yeah, that way we could see oh, yeah. everyone, because I think there's. Oh, got um, it, I don't know. Let me. Okay, it seems like maybe our music is not uh, working, but that's okay. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, hello. My name is Asma El Huni, and I am honored to open tonight uh, this very special day. Um, we're going to start off with a land acknowledgement. At Rights and Democracy, we acknowledge the Abiniki peoples as the traditional caretakers of Endekina, which includes parts of Vermont, New Hampshire, New England, and Quebec, as well as the Mohican peoples of Southern Vermont, as guests on this unceded territory of these people, we honor their ancestors and elders, and we appreciate and honor all of their relations, past, current, and future. We also acknowledge that our nation has benefited from the uncompensated and exploited labor represented in the legacy of slavery and the present day reality of migrant workers. I wanna thank everyone for joining us tonight. Um, a little bit about Rights and Democracy Institute, also known as RDI. Um, Rights and Democracy Institute is a bi-state, multi-issue organization working throughout New Hampshire and Vermont. We were founded in the year 2016. RDI um, is basically trying to unify people around interconnected and intersecting public policy solutions. Our communities are seeking to work towards economic, social, environmental, healthcare, and community justice. And we're organizing through a lens of a race class uh, lens. That's how we're organizing through. So please note contributions to the Rights and Democracy Institute, RDI, are tax deductible as we are a 501c3 charitable organization. And we want to thank everyone who has contributed in the past, but also those who will contribute tonight um, for the first time, for those of you who are contributing for the first time, and those who will be contributing in the future, right, uh, before the end of the year. So we want to give you a thank you. So this year marks, this day, I'm sorry, marks the 73rd anniversary of the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights by the UN. So though the United Nations clearly has its own issues, the adoption of human rights framework is still vital and important. And hopefully one day, its implementation and accountability for all nations, including the five permanent members of the Security Council will one day be actualized. So let's be clear, that this declaration would not be possible without the organizing efforts of people who saw the need to codify 
a set of human rights that are universal in nature. Though not perfect, it's not a perfect document yet, there are always revisions and improvements being made. It is one that many across the globe turn to and point to when there's unjust practices and when they're demanding fair treatment still. People have been organizing in their communities to ensure rights for everyone. And it is in this spirit that we are recognizing our community members who have demonstrated what it means to promote human rights. People with a backbone that inspire us, that teach us through example, that it's people, average people like you and I, who've just decided to try to make human rights a reality, to ensure that their communities are fair, that they're equitable, sustainable, and ones that allow everyone and everything to thrive. And as we move to 2022, which is around the corner, it's going to be vital that we understand that in order to help and benefit our communities, we will need to build people power and we need to build this power in both Vermont and New Hampshire to hold our state governments accountable at the efforts to violate our rights while also working to advance the rights we have not yet realized. And that's why these awards are so vital and so important, recognizing those who've demonstrated people power, the drive to demand better and actual actions to actually get better for our communities, which includes not only direct actions and we definitely need direct actions, but also understanding we need our people, we need our people in the decision-making tables as well. And now I'm going to turn it over to Jonah Wheeler, who is a leader, a badass organizer with Heal Together Campaign with Rights and Democracy in New Hampshire, and a member of the RAD board. Thank you, Asma. Always so powerful. Love, much love to you, Asma. Much love always. Uh, the RDI Human Rights Award celebrates this important day by honoring leaders and organizations whose work advances human rights and strengthens the foundations of our country. I am thrilled to celebrate the fights that stand up for the right to a just and equitable education, for the freedom to allow the next generation to learn, for honest, accurate, and fully funded public education. We celebrate the human right to a healthy and livable planet and the struggles to build a people-centered economy that is in harmony with that planet. We celebrate the struggles to stand up for the right to a dignified work <clears throat> to dignified work, which we know is deeply rooted in the struggles for human rights and justice across the board. Tonight, we are honored to have some amazing folks with us, including the next two speakers, RDI board, Amanda Jano, and Vermont Movement Politics, Kaya, Mor Kaya Morris, who will talk about the work we celebrate on Human Rights Day and introduce our first honoree of the night. Take it away, you two, thank you. Hi everyone, um, good evening and wonderful to be with you. I'm honored to be able to be a part of this really exciting event. I think we're, we're clearly in such a historic moment where paradigms are changing and shifting and there's an incredible awakening happening. We're seeing recent surveys have shown um, that over 50% of the world globally now believes that capitalism is doing more harm than good. There's a recognition of their problem, but even more powerful, there's a recognition of the solution as well, a call for communities and governments to start focusing on what really matters, which is people and planet's well-being. And so as we work towards recognizing and realizing that we're not here to serve the economy, it's here to serve us. We're also seeing incredible examples with communities coming together of showing different alternative methods for producing and providing for one another in a way that's really just and fair. And so I'm excited for us to have this incredible group of speakers and to hand it over to Kaya to tell us more about what's happening here in our community. Thanks. Thank you so much, Amanda. This really is a celebration and what an incredible opportunity for us as a state, um, both in Vermont and New Hampshire for us to say boldly, this is what we believe leadership looks like, right? These are the values that we hold and these are people who are embodying that, those beautiful values. So there is something very exciting afoot. In 2020, Vardy I joined a really ambitious project um, going into the start of 2021. And as we've been making our way through this pandemic times, there has been a distinct 
an important point of celebration that I am so excited that we've been able to hold. At that time, Rights and Democracy Institute joined a group of folks from across New England into an ambitious project called the Renew New England Alliance. It's a regional collaboration to push for a just and sustainable response to our climate crisis. It's built on the tenets of cross-racial solidarity, a just economy, deep engagement and centering the voices and dreams of our most impacted communities, and a democracy that works for all of us and not just the wealthy few. It's a powerful moment that's taken a hold of New England and it's making real strides in both New Hampshire and in Vermont. The work of Renew is our answer in a way to the national fights within the National Green New Deal efforts. And it builds on grassroots, multi-tactical strategies to help win our fights. One of the folks that we are excited to be in community with around this work of Renew has been the Reverend Mariama White, who has um, been a leader within so much of the, these efforts, um, a true friend, a hero, Shiro, <laughs> someone that we look up to as um, a guiding light within all of this work. Reverend Mariama White Hammond is a minister. She's a community activist who works on the environmental, racial, and economic justice issues that are happening across the globe. She is both the founding pastor of the New Roots African American Episcopal Church in Dorchester, Massachusetts. But even before she began in the AME Church in her ordination there, she was the director of an important project that was bringing youth into the arts as a way to communicate and educate on social justice topics called Project Hip Hop. Reverend Mariama is one of the founders of the Renew New England Alliance and has recently taken this leadership to then be appointed to help support the state of Boston as the chief of environment, energy, and open space for the city. Woo! Let's just take a moment for that, right? And in this role, Reverend Mariama White ha Hammond has been responsible for leading the cabinet in achieving its mission of trying to enhance environmental justice and the quality of life for people in Boston by protecting our air, our water, our climate, and our land resources, as well as preserving and improving the integrity of Boston's architectural and its historical resources. It is bringing things full circle for a just future for us all. So it is my pleasure to welcome here tonight and for us to be able to hear the amazing work from Reverend Mariama Whiteham and welcome. Thank you guys, it's, been so, it's so great to be here. Um, and really, um, I'm also wanted to thank you for your leadership. Um, it's just a, a pleasure to be part of this group. Um, I, I call Boston my home for sure, um, but I am also part of a collective of uh, 10 folks of African descent who um, launched a farm in Loudoun, New Hampshire uh, last year. And um, we started in the drought. And then this year we had the deluge of so much rain um, that <laughs> some of our crops that life get a little, a little drier had, had a tougher time. So um, it's great to be here um, with you and to celebrate um, the important work of rights and democracy. You know, I've, uh, my first engagement with this movement was in the seventh grade when I um, was part of the boycott against uh, South Africa uh, or against uh, Coca-Cola for its role in the apartheid uh, regime in South Africa. And that was my entree to organizing work and brought me in and gave me an opportunity to connect with folks around the world and that's really the way that I learned the human rights frame. This moment where I got to understand how we as human beings are so deeply connected and tied to each other. And this idea that an injustice many miles away in a place I had never been meant something to me. And I was a seventh grader and I remember I, I didn't have a lot of money, so I'm not sure that Coca-Cola missed me, but I remember going, um, every day to camp and they only had Coke products. So I drank water the entire time that summer and others would try to tempt me like, don't you want some Fanta? Uh, <laughs> but that was my um, way of 
of showing my solidarity with folks around the world. And so it's really um, exciting to have you all celebrating, honoring, remembering the importance of human rights because it connects us. Because it says that it's not just about what's happening in my neighborhood or my town, even my city or state, but really we are in a connected global struggle across the globe to bring about a change. When people ask me the work that I consider myself doing, there's lots of terms I believe in, climate justice and environmental justice and, and the Green New Deal, so many things. There's so many terms that people use and all of them resonate. But the term that I use to describe my work is ecological justice. And that's because eco means home. And I know that, you know, Elon Musk and a few other people are trying to figure out how to get to, to Mars. But from my perspective, we only have one home. And if we don't get it together, the earth is not gonna go away. She's gonna be fine. She may lose some things, but she will continue to exist. The question is whether or not we deserve to be here. And from my perspective, if we cannot learn to take care of the home we already have, if we cannot be in right relationship with each other in this place, this abundant, amazing world that we live in, then we don't deserve to go to some other planet and destroy it as we've done this one that we already have. And I say ecological justice because ecology studies the relationship between things. Biology often breaks things down and you have chemistry that looks things at, at things in their compounds, but ecology as, a, as a, a scientific discipline says that you can only understand an organism when you look at the other things with which it shares space. And my belief is that we don't just have a climate crisis, we have an ecological crisis because we have a crisis of relationship. That we do not know how to live right with one another. And the human rights frame and the work of rights and democracy is about asking the question, how do we want to live with each other? How do we wanna make sure that our neighbors are not struggling in such a way that they cannot make ends meet? How do we make sure that if I participate in something that the workers who make it possible are also treated justly? How do we make sure that even in some of our states that are not known for being the most diverse <laughs> in America, that those of us who are folks of color and particularly indigenous folks of color who've been there since forever are being treated with the rights and respect that they deserve? These are all the central questions of being in right relationship of finding not just the human rights that I have, but the human rights that belong to each and every one of us and figuring out how we negotiate that. As Kai talked about the work of, of Renew New England, we are particularly looking at this moment of crisis, this crisis of our planet, but also the crisis that this pandemic has, has brought. When we got started, I remember we had our first meeting in January, everybody showed up, we were excited. We were talking about where we were going to meet next, see you in April. <laughs> and then only a few short months later, the pandemic hit and everything changed. And there are many things I could talk about that I do not love about this pandemic. I think like all of you, I really just want it to be over. That being said, I do think in many ways, it has pushed us to ask questions about what we owe to each other and how we live in right relationship with our neighbors. And we have some real opportunities. There are millions of dollars, billions of dollars, trillions of dollars flowing from Washington in a way that they never have. And it is a once in a lifetime opportunity for us to get right how we put at the front of the line those folks who are always put in the back of the line. And so I hope um, that even as we celebrate tonight, that we actually are committing not to sit on our laurels and not just to celebrate what has been, but to commit that together, we're gonna fight even harder. Now, because of the farm, I spent a little time in, in New Hampshire 
And um, the struggle is real. The struggle is real. I, I've never seen uh, such a big legislature. It's, it's kind of amazing. <laughs> um, but the reality is um, the work of justice begins in small communities. It doesn't begin, I, I've done a lot of work around the uh, civil rights movement and they, they tell me all these mass meetings everybody talks about, those were often the culminating points. But there were many months, many years, where were small groups of people that just kept holding out, just kept talking to their neighbors who told them that they were crazy. And then when the moment came, all of the seeds they had planted began to come to fruition. So I'm here to thank you for all the seeds that you're planting, for the work that you're doing, sometimes that yields successes that you can celebrate, and sometimes that feels frustrating. But it is the hard work of ecological justice to which we are all called. And I'm thankful to be connected to an organization, to folks on the ground who are committed to doing that work day in and day out. And so I celebrate um, all of you, the, the staff, the volunteers, the other folks who are being honored tonight, um, really great. And I'm glad that we are taking this moment, even virtually, to celebrate the important work, the hard work, and to remind ourselves that we are called to do it together. The greatest gift we have is each other, and only together do we have any chance of winning um, the kind of world we hope and dream for. So thank you for having me tonight. I am so blessed um, to be connected and to know this work. Um, and I look forward to continuing to do the work together. Woo, that was beautiful. So you know that this is a Rights and Democracy event and we are here in community. Thank you so much, Reverend Mariama, for your beautiful words, your uplifting spirit and your constant fight and dedication. I wanna see things happening in the chat. I need to see emojis being thrown up. I hope y'all are blowing up social media right now. Hashtag amazing, okay? So this is so important that we hold that spirit. This is the social contract that we have together. How are we holding one another? I think is a beautiful transition from this really, truly powerful conversation we just had as an opportunity for us to listen and hear the beautiful gospel stylings of none other than the Vermont Revival Resistance Choir and their gorgeous music, which I hope will stir your heart and keep you in this community. Thank you so much, Reverend Mariama, and I hope that you all will enjoy this next piece. Thank you so much.
Yes, that's right. Did you feel that? I hope you felt that. I hope you felt that. We are not done fighting. Not by a long shot. So it is my pleasure. Thank you so much to the Resistance Revival Chorus for always gifting us with the healing work of music and art. So important for us to continue to have that as a part of our movement work. How we express, how we show up, and how we give back. Right. So our engagement with the Resistance Revival Chorus honestly would not have happened if not for the great work of James Hazen, who is the founder of the Rights and Democracy Institute. Um, we have had the pleasure of working under his leadership for the last six years now, building out this community where we have come into community and had an opportunity to learn and lift up so many along the way. And it has always been a key part of the way that James has tried to help create this space, that we've stepped into this space and replicated this energy to say, how do I hold the door open for others to follow? that I don't own it. It is not about the me, but it is about the we, right? It is all of us. And so I am so grateful to be able to have- She's James not getting here. an award. She's just a featured speaker. Okay. So thank you for that correction. Appreciate that. So we are so excited to be able to now welcome um, James Haslam for our next portion and to um, help us in getting ready to introduce our amazing awardees. Thank you so much, Kaya. It's great to see uh, you all here tonight. Thank you so much for everyone who who uh, who is here tonight. I um, I am just thrilled about uh, you know what thinking about it this time of year. Uh, you know how far we've come uh, for Rights and Democracy Institute, and uh, and then just seeing you know the folks that we are honoring uh, here uh, tonight. Uh, uh, amazing partner that you all got to meet if you hadn't already with Reverend Mariama, with with Renew, um, the uh, the folks we're we're, we're honoring uh, here are are truly amazing leaders in this movement. And um, one of the things that I've been most excited about for what what Rights and Democracy Institute is trying to be building, we've been growing uh, Rights and Democracy uh, for the last six years doing a lot of work fighting for our rights, uh, organizing around, uh, we call like issue campaigns, fighting to win paid sick days, raise the minimum wage, healthcare justice, housing justice, racial justice, but policies. And, and that's a lot of where our support comes, but we've also wanted to, along the way, really invest in the next generation of leadership, uh, both a new generation of organizers, but also people organizing in the public arena that when you stick your neck out as, as, uh, as Kai has done and, and, uh, and, and uh, so many leaders have done uh, to, to represent our communities, to provide leadership for their communities, that we are able to, to help bring many more people into, uh, into that uh, public arena with as much training and support uh, as we possibly can. 
and, and having those uh, leaders come from places that are often aren't asked to, to serve in those uh, roles. So uh, often most impacted uh, communities. And uh, I just am, am, am thrilled about the, the, the progress we've made in 20, uh, 2021 around leadership education. And it wouldn't have been possible uh, without uh, one of the leaders, uh, early leaders of rights and democracy, who's exactly uh, demonstrated what it means to step up when there's a void in the community, to make your voices heard, and to invite other people to step up and, and grow uh, the movement. So I'm really thrilled to turn it over to, to Mia Schultz, who has been uh, the founder of the Catalyst Leadership uh, Program and coordinator and uh, has some exciting uh, uh, presentation for you all about that program. Uh, Mia, thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you so much for your leadership. We just adore you. Thank you so much. And, um, you know, there have been, if it wasn't for rights and democracy, I wouldn't have stepped into my own leadership. Many, many people um, had to tell me that I deserved and belonged, uh, belong at this table of being a leader. And so it's been quite the journey and I'm so grateful for Rights and Democracy. So in June, 2021, we, Rights and Democracy Institute stayed, uh, started Catalyst Leadership Program. This is a cohort of uh, 20 members from New Hampshire and, and, and Vermont, specifically geared towards people who are BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, people of color, LGBTQIA, and pe people with disabilities and women. And it's not like any other um, leadership program. It meant to be a safe space to holistically support folks who have been historically marginalized and as they strive to find their seat and, and at, at these leadership tables that we're talking about. So our first set of cohorts uh, recently completed their training and some of them created their videos. That was part of the training was to create a video about the story of their self. So I, without talking anymore, I wanna present the video. We put a little montage together. Um, I hope it, it inspires you for our, you know, our future. Hello everyone, my name is Brad Peacock. I'm an organic vegetable farmer from Shaftesbury, Vermont, and have been a part of the Catalyst Leadership Program. Today I am talking with you about economic justice. Greetings, my name is Matthew LaFleur. I'm from Grand Isle County of Vermont. I am a disability rights advocate. This is my daughter, Whitney Davis, and her daughter, Taylor. I'm bringing you today bias in healthcare. Hi, my name is Ryer Erickson. I'd like to tell you about my experience in education justice. I ended up in a political science class and shared a political theory and just completely fell in love. And the section that hit me the deepest was the section on utopias. I was born with major major medical issues that still affect me today. Since my birth, I have to overcome many challenges as a person with a disability. I've spoken with family and friends about what their ideas of economic justice are, and the overall consensus is lifting people out of poverty, which is where I found myself growing up that really, really shaped my life in in a lot of ways and how it is that that i'm able to give back to people especially now as a farmer and especially around food security about two years ago i moved to st albans uh, it's a little city in northwestern vermont and uh, after moving here uh, pretty soon after realized that there was a large issue with uh, the police a group of concerned citizens and I got together and started advocating for uh, better um, police accountability. 
Uh, in this work, we discovered that the school had what's called uh, school resource officers or SROs. I can't leave the skin, nor could my daughter. And yet, she's no longer here with me because people, one, didn't see her illness as something that needed to be addressed right away. And I feel personally, because of the color of her skin, the hindrances were truly from systemic, from systemic racism and white supremacy culture. When I was young, grew up during the Reagan years where it was all about the welfare queen or takers. And I just can't tell you how detrimental to one's psyche and society that can be. And that is not who we are as a country. And I know it's, it's just not who we want to be. I continually saw that we chose to invest in harm and punishment in our policing and prison systems, in our war machine, in everything. We just chose that over human life, compassion and care. It got me thinking where I would be if people didn't invest in me my whole life. This is why I choose abolition. This is why I choose to divest from the war, prison and police machine into love, community and care. There is no end to what I won't do for my kids. And at the same level, there is no end that I won't do to protect people. Unfortunately, certain implicit bias exists in healthcare. Bias can lead to people receiving poor treatment, receiving inaccurate diagnoses, or experiencing delays in diagnosis. For the ones who decide they will triage healthcare based on color of skin, I will say this to you. Shame on you. Shame on you for the thousands, millions of lives lost because you decide that your bias was more important than saving that person's life or the oath that you took. I have found out that people with disabilities, people still do not receive equal consideration for organ transplants. This concerns me because I still struggle with medical issues. This law needs to change because one, I am a human being and I deserve equal access to medical care. Two, we all deserve equal access to medical care. If you can deny me my rights, then you can deny other people their rights. When we speak of economic justice, some of the, the large things are just pay equity. Um, it's very important to when we, we're talking about lifting people up and lifting people out of poverty to give them the wages that, that they have earned and deserve. At the very beginning, we were laughed at. We were scorned. We were made fun of. And after 14 months, we were able to walk out of a school board meeting, having just witnessed them removing the SROs from our schools. I received threats. I received nasty comments almost daily through Messenger. Uh, Facebook Messenger, I uh, put a lot of my mental health on the line. I did a lot. Um, and it all was worth it because I knew that at the end of the day, my daughter would never come home as she did one day and tell me that she had to hide in the bathroom because a police officer was in her classroom. Our state is currently in the process of constructing a mega prison. This prison will be around $50 million. While I said earlier, our high school still needs to be replaced. We have people around the state that need housing and we need other social safety nets. Prison abolition is about so much more than the eradication of our jails and prisons. What it requires is truly transformational. It demands a change of the status quo around how we respond to and define harm, rehabilitation, and other social issues that 
land people in prisons in the first place. I would like to bring attention and awareness to healthcare bias and inequity so we can further the work that needs to be done to make sure that another life is not lost, that we hear you, we see you, and we know that these bias exist. But we are working on now is a way to eradicate and dismantle. It does not have to be this way. We must all push forward together for access to health care for all. It's really up to us to show up in any way that we can to help one another and to lift one another up. It's about prioritizing every community member and securing access to resources and opportunities that they need to not only survive, but thrive. It's about building community power. We can push back on the state's plan and instead come up with creative community-based solutions. The idea that an educational building would be a place where any student would feel scared, unwelcome, unheard is absolutely unacceptable. And I will continue to do the work in my community that needs to be done. I'm going to run for school board again. I'm going to keep attending school board meetings and I'm gonna make sure that students in our schools feel safe, not just in Maple Run, but across Vermont and eventually hopefully across the United States. These students deserve to feel safe and heard and loved in their place of education. We are all the farmers of our future. And so let us sow the seeds of change and cultivate our communities, root for each other's rise and grow our future together. When we choose to prioritize care and love over punishment, maybe that utopian society won't be as impossible. I'm just so grateful to have learned so much and listened um, to everyone tell their stories. Thank you to Rights and Democracy Institute. Thank you to Mia Schultz for just amazing leadership and always creating a safe space for everyone. And thank you to my fellow co members. It's just been a real honor. Yes. Yay. So shout out. I got a little, little, you know, lump in my throat. Shout out to our first cohort members of 2021. I'm looking forward to 2022. And as we grow out that program, we are going to be growing out more leaders in education through honest, honest teaching and education as well. So look out to, for so much more happening. And I'd love to start right away in recognizing 2020 recipients of our Human Rights Awards, the very first one because this award, these awards are usually given to leaders in our local and regional and national organizations who have made significant contributions to the movement for human rights and democracy. And we believe in the power of that collective action and any individuals honored are recognized for their role within an organization or group engaged in a concerted action for advancing or protecting the human rights and democracy. We lift up the individuals, groups, and organizations who collaborate with rights and democracy to advance this mission and with whom we hope to build this movement for human rights and democracy. So with that, and you know, combining that with our new leaders that need to be sitting at our tables always, I am so proud to introduce Iris Shung, who is a senior at Essex High School. She's the youth representative for the Vermont Climate Council. She's a student representative on the EWSD school board in Essex. Um, and she's a community organizer in so many capacities. 
it's so exciting to see her. Every time I see her, she lights up the room because I want to pay attention to what our future has to say. And this is our future. Um, they're a leader at our, their EH8 Social Justice Union and a member, and they contributed in many other community organizers, organizations. Iris, congratulations. You for your award. Thank you so much. Um, I am really so honored to receive this award. And yet I, I know that none of the work is possible without the other students and the parents and the teachers and community organizers and members um, who, who make this work happen. Um, and especially the other people of, of color who crafted our equity policy for our district. Um, and the students who came out to ensure that the Black Lives Matter flag um, wasn't taken off of our flagpoles um, because our, our district has recently become this, this proxy war um, and, and a pawn in a national playbook and rhetoric meant to um, spur hate and degrade the education of my peers and I has just been flown, flowing all around our community. Um, but through um, community organization and, and perseverance, we, we were still able to push for this like slow march um, of progress. And through the hard work of community members, we were able to, to resist. Um, and and it's, it's a national trend. Um, and while we've been able to persist in our district, um, others across the country have lost to um, the white supremacy that is trying right now across the nation to claw its way back into the forefront of our communities. Um, and, and sometimes I know that it can feel like this is an intense work of labor for, for marginal returns, but I wanna reiterate just how important this work is. Um, I wanna remind you all that this work is vital, that students need education justice, um, and that we need strong ad advocates in the name of it. Um, a few days ago, there was an op-ed in our school newspaper from a queer student who explained how librarians um, and libraries made them feel so seen and allowed them to find out who they are and their role in the community. And that, that really resonated with me. And, and in the end, that's what it's all about. It's about allowing all students to see themselves in their education and to learn the true history, to learn their history and learn how to be a member of their communities. Um, and the education in our system has too long been a system of oppression and it's been used to teach us how to hate one another. But um, when, when we really work together and do this organizing, this hard work, we, we can sort of try and shift it to build it into a tool that builds community and builds love. Um, so thank you so much. I really appreciate all the work of Rights to Democracy, um, especially in helping us in our district and just doing incredible work across our state and across the nation. So thank you. Thank you, Iris. Hey, everybody. Um, I am Isaac Graham. I'm the deputy director with Rights and Democracy. Um, really amazing to see what you're doing already at that age, Iris. You are such an inspiration. Uh, well beyond where I was at your age, I cannot wait to see like you continue to grow in your power and your voice and in your leadership. Like The future is bright. So thank you for what you're doing already. Um, so um, uh, uh, Myself and uh, my colleague Lydia are going to be helping introduce our next awardee. Um, so I, again, I'm Isaac Grimm. I'm on staff with Rights and Democracy. I'm based out of New Hampshire. Um, and I'm calling from uh, my parents' house in upstate New York. Um, and I'll pass it over to Lydia to introduce herself. Hi, my name is Lydia. I work for the American Friends Service Committee New Hampshire program. And I'm a board member of the Rights and Democracy Institute. Thanks, Lydia. Um, and you know, before we introduce Emma, uh, each of us just wanted to share a little bit about um, why Emma's work to fight climate change and the climate crisis is so important to us and how this connects to us. And I know that for everyone on this call, we all have a very deep connection to uh, the need to be a part of this movement and to the need to address this massive crisis. Um, so, I mean, for myself, um, having grown up across the street from the Onondaga Nation, um, I, and it's, that's where I am right now, look across the street, this is like an international border, um, uh, really grew up with this dichotomy of right of like the, the sort of white American view of the world that we can just take from it. Um, and then my neighbors having a very different grounding and understanding, um, that's much more based in ecology and, uh, you know, a holistic view of our, ourselves as a part of nature, not as 
uh, domineering over it. Um, and since I, I realized a few months ago that my, my partner and I are going to be having a baby in the spring, um, it just feels more urgent to me now than ever that we are doing everything we can to make sure that the next generations are going to have a livable planet. Um, and what I'm really excited about to see in the climate uh, movement today, and that I think Emma exemplifies in so many ways, is that we cannot be just fighting for like climate change as its own solo issue. We have to be tackling all of the issues as part of this if we ever want to have, have a chance to win. Um, so for me, it just feels more important now than it ever has. Um, and I'm really excited that we're lifting up Emma for her work in this, in this movement. And I'll uh, pass it back to Lydia to share a bit of her perspective on that. So my home country, South Sudan, um, it's the newest country in the world right now. So um, it's one of the most vulnerable to climate change. And South Sudan is experiencing humanitarian crises and a fragile security environment. On top of that, the temperature is increasing every year. My home country relies on heavily on agriculture and climate change is causing droughts and floods. This issue is important to me because climate change is a global issue. I have family in South Sudan who are suffering from it and people are impacted by it here in the States as well. And I am grateful for people like Emma who work on climate change issues and who advocate for environment friendly alternatives. Thank you, Lydia. So yeah, super excited to introduce Emma, uh, who is currently the executive co-director of 350 New Hampshire. So you know, Emma got started around 2016 after those elections and just like couldn't see herself doing anything but being part of the fight against climate change and against the climate crisis. Um, and just in a few short years, she's gone from a local community organizer to a statewide uh, organizer on the front lines of the climate fight and uh, is now the co-director of what I think is the most badass and fearless statewide environmental uh, organization, the climate uh, organization 350 New Hampshire. Um, it's been a real privilege being able to work with Emma uh, in spaces together in the Renew Coalition. Um, I've really admired the fearless work that I've seen her doing from bird dogging presidential candidates to stopping coal trains coming into the state. Some really iconic video and, and photos of her doing this with an, an, a bunch of other um, amazing direct action oriented activists. Um, and from being able to be a part of um, some of the largest direct actions, arrestable direct actions, um, really in New Hampshire's history uh, that Emma's had a key role in, in organizing. Um, but I think even more important than that like flashy stuff, which is like a strength of Emma's, um, What's really struck me and it has resonated with me as I've talked to other people about Emma's leadership um, is that the words that kind of come up were like grace, uh, calm, caring, uh, supportive, right? Like it's, it's really clear that the people that Emma works with um, have a deep respect and admiration for her and that she really invests in the well-being of those people around her and is like a cool-headed radical, right? We need to have hot-headed radicals and we need cool-headed radicals and, uh, I'm really, uh, yeah, just happy to introduce one of my favorite cool-headed radicals in the climate movement in New Hampshire, Emma Shapiro-Weiss. Thank you so much. That I'm gonna make that my tagline now. I try. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Isaac, and thank you, Lydia. Thank you to all the RAD staff and the RAD community that I'm lucky to organize with pretty much every single day. And it's really funny that this is this event is tonight and that Isaac brought up the coal trains because I got a Facebook notification today that it's actually been two years since the train blockades I did with No Coal, No Gas in 2019. And I'm sure a lot of people on this call who've organized and did direct action for a while, you can relate that you often find yourself doing the weirdest things ever that you never thought you would do, like standing, uh, with an amazing comrade who may or may not have been a rad staffer at the time at 4 a.m. in zero degree weather for hours, trying to get a walkie talkie to work and listening to a woodpecker and just waiting for a coal train to come and trying to stop the delivery of 10,000 tons of coal that was mined, it was mined out west and was en route to Merrimack Station, which is 
the last coal plant in the Northeast, which is in Bow, New Hampshire, right outside of Concord, New Hampshire. And it was coming to pollute the water and to send particulate matter into the air and to hurt the health of the Bow community and the surrounding towns and the Merrimack River watershed. And why does it exist? I'm sure you can guess millions of dollars in subsidies to provide tiny amounts of electricity to our grid for money for a hedge fund um, or two hedge funds. And when I think back to that day two years ago, I think about bitter, bitter cold, and it's kind of the scale at which I measure all other cold days. I think about adrenaline and I think about singing and the act of being together. And when I look to the future, I often get pretty pissed off and fearful. And when I think about the state of this country, when I think about that, like Merrimack Station, there are lots of other people out there, hedge fund owners, politicians, CEOs that are getting rich off the destruction of our planet and off of letting people suffer and making people suffer. But I remind myself that I am in community with people who are strong as hell, who aren't afraid to reimagine this country and are doing that work every day, who are occupying Governor Sununu's office, who are going to DC and telling their personal stories and fighting for people, who are running for office, who are getting young BIPOC people elected, who are taking care of their community and fighting for climate justice. And sometimes it isn't that sexy. Sometimes it's facilitating a four hour Zoom retreat or trying to get 30 people to fill out a when to meet. Um, but while I do feel angry and fearful sometimes, I know that in my future, it'll also be filled with singing and occupying offices and shifting what is possible and doing whatever I can or whatever we can to stop and slow down the impacts of the climate crisis. So thank you all so much for this. And thank you for the ways that I see all of you caring for your people, caring for everyone and fighting for this vision. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emma. Really appreciate you. Um, so uh, up next, we're gonna be hearing from our uh, Beloved board member uh, of the Rights and Democracy Institute, uh, Professor Jamie McCallum. Um, sorry, I'm not sure if someone else is going to be introducing Jamie, or should I just? Cool. All right. Nope, that's so, fine. No, that's fine. That's fine. Awesome. Thank, yeah, you, thank you, Jamie. <laughs> so Jamie's yeah. gonna, Jamie's going to help uh, kind of talk to us a bit about the importance of workers' rights movements um, as part of building a multiracial democracy, and he's going to be uh, helping introduce our next big name national speaker. So thank you, Jamie. Great, Isaac, thank you so much. I feel so honored to be part of this event and to help uh, help out a little bit as secretary of the RDI, RDI board. Um, I'm a scholar and I've been a labor activist for the last two decades. And uh, so I'll just say a few things before I introduce our next, our next speaker, um, as I was asked to do. <laughs> uh, workers and their organizations are the foundation of any movement for social change. Racism and white supremacy are the biggest obstacles to working class unity. And so therefore, as a scholar and an, and an organizer, I have tend to see, see that race and class never appear in pure form. It's not even that they intersect sort of in the common wisdom of today, that they're always reinforcing and co-constituting co each other, tearing each other down or bringing each other together. The pandemic was a, a very recent example of this process, right? So Black Lives Matter chapters were formed uh, in the break rooms of essential workplaces. And the multiracial group of essential workers that staffed the front lines of our grocery stores and healthcare centers and nursing homes were also on the front lines of anti-police protests in the summer of 2020. This moment for me illuminated the old uh, sort of left labor adage that an injury to one is an injury to all or as the, uh, as the other groups of people used to put it, that we're all better off when we're all better off. This doesn't mean that sort of we're all in this together, the sort of liberal middle of the road kind of 
way of thinking. Rather, it shows us that the US working class is the foundation of US democracy. And because our workers lack the power and dig dignity they deserve and need, our democracy exists in name only. As Louis Brandeis famously said, you'll have a situation where 1% of the people control all the wealth, or you'll have democracy, but you won't have both. And I'm pretty sure we all know what we have today. So if essential worker jobs are rotten, our lives are miserable too. If teachers don't have what they need, our kids won't either. If migrants work in unsafe meatpacking houses, our food will be dirty and contaminated. If healthcare workers don't have healthcare themselves, our care when we're, when we're under their care will be substandard. If restaurant workers earn poverty wages and face rampant sexual harassment, restaurants won't survive. If, and you know, if there's, so in other words that, you know, our health and wealth and well-being as a society is directly linked to the kinds of conditions that working class people uh, enjoy or don't enjoy. Um, in my field, I'm a labor scholar, and in my field, much ink has been spilled about the future of work. And what these articles, and journalists as well, and what these articles always talk about are shiny robotics factories, you know, with Elon Musk there or Mark Zuckerberg here or whomever. And rarely in these stories do we talk about the future of workers. And so when you picture the future of workers, the, the thing we should have in mind is a woman of color in scrubs. Those are the fastest growing jobs in the US and actually we need far more of them than we are producing. They're wildly disproportionately held by people of color and especially women and they're wildly underpaid. Now picture for the most of US history, women of color caregivers have been systematically excluded from even the most progressive policy projects that the left champions like the New Deal. We must ensure that in the next New Deal, our New Deal, a Green New Deal, we will have room for all the working class and those who lift all of us up. No one in the US perhaps, in my opinion, has worked harder to tie the realities of racial justice and worker power than Saru Jarman. I'm sure she doesn't probably remember this moment, but I first met her actually the same time I met James Haslam at the Life After Capitalism Conference in New York City, which I think was like 2000, five or something. I went to her panel and heard her speak. And I thought to myself, wow, my God, here is someone who I would like, whose career I would like to follow in some capacity. And so I'm doubly honored to introduce her today. Um, Saru Jairman is the president of One Fair Wage and director of the Food Labor Research Center at the University of California, Berkeley. Saru has spent the last 20 years organizing and advocating for raising wages and working conditions for restaurant and other service workers. Saru is a graduate of Yale Law School and the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. She was listed in CNN's top 10 visionary women and recognized as a champion of change by the White House in 2014. The James Beard Foundation Leadership Award in 2015 and the San Francisco Chronicle Visionary of the Year Award in 2019. Saru authored Behind the Kitchen Door, uh, which I actually assigned in my labor, my labor history class, a national bestseller, Forked, a, a new standard for American dining. That, was, that came out in 2016. And most recently, Bite Back, People Taking on Corporate Food and Winning. That was published just in 2020. She's appeared on MSNBC, HBO, PBS, CBS, CBS CNN. She attended the, and she attended the Golden Globes in January 2018 with Amy Poehler as part of the Time's Up action to address, address sexual harassment. So please, let's give a warm Zoom uh, rights and democracy welcome to Saru J. Arman. Thank you so much. Can you all hear me and see me? Okay. Thank you so much for such a nice uh, introduction. I really appreciate it. And it's great to be with all of you on a Friday evening. Um, and it's great to be with you in a moment when it, it really does feel like, at least in our world, um, you know, 20 years of organizing and 150 years of uh, real suffering by restaurant workers is on the precipice of enormous 
huge upheaval and change because of the pandemic. So just a little bit of background and then want to share where, what, what's happening, uh, which I think is one of, in my mind, one of the silver linings of this moment. Um, you know, prior to the pandemic, the restaurant industry was one of the largest and fastest growing sectors of the US economy, nearly 13 million workers. That was one in 10 Americans worked in restaurants and one in two Americans who had worked in the industry at some point in their lifetime. But despite the size of the industry and its growth, it's been the number one fastest growing industry in the US for decades. And still, despite all of that, it's been the absolute lowest paying employer in the US also for generations largely due to the money power and influence of a trade lobby called the National Restaurant Association. We call it the other NRA. It represents the chains, the IHOPs, the Applebee's, the Olive Gardens. This trade lobby is so powerful, so um, uh, intensely uh, malicious, I would say. They've, they've followed me around the country when my children were babies. They put them up on attack websites. Um, you know, they, they are bullies. And it turns out they've been around for 150 years since emancipation uh, when they first demanded the right to hire newly freed slaves and not pay them anything and have them live entirely on this newfangled idea that had just come from Europe at the time called tipping. Tipping had originated in feudal Europe. It was always an extra or bonus on top of the wage. But when it came to the States, the restaurant lobby wanted the ability to basically continue slavery essentially not pay workers. And so they mutated tipping from being an extra bonus on top of the wage to becoming the wage itself. And so there really is no other way to understand the wage structure in the restaurant industry today, other than to understand it as a devaluation of women's work and black lives, because that is what it is. And it became law in 1938 as part of the New Deal when everybody else got the right to the minimum wage for the first time, except for millions of black workers. Farm workers were left out mostly black, domestic workers were left out mostly black, and tipped workers who were mostly black, mostly women, were told, you get nothing, you get tips. And we went from a $0 wage in 1938 all the way up to $2.13 an hour. And the states that RAD is active in, New Hampshire, the wage is $3.27 an hour. Um, Vermont, the wage is around $5 an hour. I mean, it is a pathetic, outrageous embarrassment for the United States of America to have a wage that is under $5 an hour, $5 or less, for four out of five states in the United States today because of a persistence of a legacy of slavery and an enormously powerful trade lobby that has gotten away with essentially telling America and Congress and state legislators. And by the way, legislators from both parties, Democrats and Republicans, that they should not have to pay their own workers' wages, that you and we, the customers, we should pay their workers' wages for them through our tips. And that has been the system for decades. Well, the pandemic has come and workers have had enough because even prior to the pandemic, this was a overwhelmingly female workforce, a workforce overwhelmingly women, um, about two thirds women. In fact, New Hampshire had the highest percentage of women restaurant workers of any state in the US. Overwhelmingly women, overwhelmingly women working in very casual restaurants, disproportionately women of color, struggling with the highest rates of economic instability and sexual harassment of any industry in the US because they had to put up with all kinds of inappropriate customer behavior to get tips. Well, that got so much worse with the pandemic. With the pandemic, we tracked 6 million restaurant workers lost their jobs during the shutdown of last March. Two thirds of those workers were told they couldn't get unemployment insurance because in most states they were told their wages were too low to qualify for benefits. They were told, looks like you earn too little, you can't get benefits. And that was a lightning bulb moment. So many workers we heard from said, wait a second, if I'm being told that I earn too little to get benefits, probably I earn too little. And I never should have put up with this in the first place. You know, right now there's so much press on the great resignation, which we're calling the great rebellion, because it's not people like sighing with resignation. It's people saying enough, enough. But the thing that the press has gotten wrong is that it, it's not a 2021 phenomenon. It started in 2020 when workers were told enough isn't, you know, we don't, you don't earn enough to get benefits. 
and they were done. And they went back to work last summer, many of them, and found that tips were weighed down because sales were down and customer hostility and harassment and health risks were way up. And thousands of women reported they were regularly asked, take off your mask so I can see how cute you are before I decide how much to tip you. Take off my, your mask so I can see the pretty face of my server before I decide how much to tip. Turning this issue from a legacy of slavery and a source of economic, racial, and gender injustice to a matter of truly life or death. I mean, these workers have been asked over the last year and a half to enforce social distancing mask rules and now even COVID vaccination card rules on the very same people from whom they're supposed to get tips to survive, forget it. The workers have said, take your job and shove it. They have said enough is enough and we're not gonna put up with it anymore. And our calculations show 1.2 million Americans, 1.2 million restaurant workers have less, left this industry since the pandemic started. That's a 10th of the industry has left. And of those who remain, we surveyed workers this year, of those who remain in the industry, 54%, more than half, say they are going to leave. And 78% of people who are leaving say the only thing that would make them stay or come back to work in restaurants is a full minimum wage with tips on top. So it's already so hopeful and amazing that you're in this moment of incredible worker power and leverage where workers across the country, not just in restaurants, but in sectors across the country are saying enough is enough. Some people I, I, I think are looking at these job numbers and saying, whoa, this is terrible. You know, Workers aren't going back to work, what's wrong? And there is something wrong for sure, but we have to applaud and celebrate and you know, just commend people across the economy from corporate America down to restaurant workers saying enough is enough. I'm not gonna put up with it anymore. I don't even, I don't, I don't, I can't even afford to work in restaurants anymore. It costs me more in childcare and transportation to get to work than I get when I get there. It's not worth it anymore. And here's the incredible silver lining. We've been counting, we've been looking at job postings, idealists, Craigslist, we have tracked over 3000 restaurants in 43 states that pay a subminimum wage, including New Hampshire and Vermont, now paying an average of $15 an hour plus tips. We are tracking restaurants paying 15, 20, 25. We've seen some restaurants in Massachusetts paying 50 bucks an hour plus tips because they cannot find workers willing to work for two and $3 anymore. They are not able to fully reopen. They are not fully able to staff their restaurants. You've all seen restaurants with signs that say, we can't open every seven days a week. We don't have enough people. And it's because workers are standing up and employers are having to raise wages. And mind you, many of these are restaurants that said, we'll never be able to afford 10 and 12 and 15. It's impossible. We'll go out of business now saying, please come work for us. I'll pay you 15, 20, even $50 an hour. Come back. And so here we are in this incredible moment of change, upheaval, opportunity. Workers are rising up and saying enough is enough. Employers are raising wages voluntarily. Guess who is always the last to figure it out? <laughs> Sadly, it's our policymakers are always the last to figure it out. How is it that when you have a moment where you've got workers saying we won't go back without this and employers paying it, and so the opposition has greatly reduced, what is stopping our democratic leadership? Because we do have democratic leadership for the moment in, in the House and the Senate and, and in the presidency. What is stopping our democratic leadership from making this the law? I mean, even the employers are saying, we can't do this alone. We need a level playing field. We can't do this alone. We need policy to send a signal to millions of workers. It is worth coming back to work in restaurants because these, these are permanent wage increases. The workers are not dumb. They know that unless this is the law, these employers could go back to paying two and three and $5 next year. So they're not coming back until we raise the wage. And this comes down to the last piece I'm gonna say, which is that this is no longer an issue just about low wage workers. It's not an issue just about employers. It's not even an issue just about our economy. This is fundamentally about our democracy. We all know that our democracy is in peril. We all know that we are on the brink of perhaps a different form of government unless we 
take care and come together. And part of the concern has to be not just, do we stop Trump? Do we stop, you know, the likes that would take, you know, try to, uh, you know, engage in some kind of fraudulent coup? It's not just that. It's millions of people in America who feel incredibly disaffected, disillusioned, unhappy with our political system, with people who have promised them wage increases, who in fact got into office and they voted for them based on wage increases and have not delivered. Do you know restaurant workers have a 12% voter turnout rate? And in the states where we've put this on the ballot or made this the key issue, where elected officials have made this the key issue of a campaign, we have seen a 300% increase in voter turnout among these workers, 300%. So if we care about these workers actually participating, not allowing the likes of Trump to rise up, not allowing our democracy be, to be taken over. If we want a robust democracy where actually the majority of people can engage, then we have to raise these wages both because this is the moment, this is the opportunity, but also because there is no other way to save our democracy or to move on other issues we care about like climate change or reproductive justice or really anything else unless these huge swaths of low wage workers have the ability and the wherewithal and the will to engage. And they will not, they will not have that will unless we actually raise the wage. And if we don't care about anything else I've, I've talked about, at the very least, if you care about eating out in the same way that you did prior to the pandemic, you won't be able to unless we raise the wage because these workers aren't coming back. They aren't coming back unless the wages go up. So I am so honored and thrilled and grateful to Rights and Democracy for being a partner with us in this fight in New Hampshire and hopefully soon in Vermont. We are going to get this done. If we can't get it done in Congress this year, we're going to get it done in multiple states at, on the ballot uh, through legislation in multiple states across the country. And I'm so excited to do that with you. This is one of the few silver linings of the moment. Let's get behind these workers who are saying enough is enough. Thank you so much. Wow. Um, wow, this has been a really amazing night with, um, uh, speakers, Reverend White Hammond, thank you so much for that um, talk on ecological justice and how we need to understand that we need to be in right relationship with our neighbors. Um, Iris, Emma, and Saru, thank you, thank you so much for your work. Um, um, hi, I'm Margaret Daly, and um, I serve on the Rights and Democracy um, Institute board. What I really appreciate about Rights and Democracy um, in addition to being able to associate with all you wonderful people, um, is it's holistic approach to human rights. Um, you know, there's so many great or other great organizations that focus on a single aspect of human rights, like climate justice or housing justice. Um, but as a healthcare professional, um, I really understand how a person's health is not just related to whether they can get health insurance and whether they have health. Um, access to healthcare, um, and as far as uh, like our um, uh, participants in the Catalyst um, Leadership um, Program pointed out, a healthcare system that's free of bias against um, people of um, color and people with disabilities. Um, but those are all important, but we also have to have access to good food. We have to have access to good housing. We have to have access to a clean environment um, for people to ha have, um, to be healthy and to thrive. Um, and then they need, for their mental health, they need a robust education. Um, and as our uh, Saru Park um, pointed out, fair treatment in the workplace. Um, rights and democracy really understands that all these factors are intertwined and need to be worked on in order to accomplish equity and justice for all. So I hope you can join me in supporting Rights and Democracy Institute um, financially if you're able to. Um, rights and Democracy Institute is a 
501c3 um, organization. So your donation is tax deductible. Um, in addition to that, It appears Margaret just froze for a moment here, but um, I do want to thank her very much for bringing this incredible story um, to why this is so important. We are a multi-tactical, multi-racial organization that is seeking to change the way that we think about our relationship to government and to really build a movement that works for all of us. So it is so important that you're able to be a part of these conversations and to help contribute to our sustainability now and well into the future. Um, these are the fights that we're fighting for, including broadband access and, and internet connectivity um, so that we don't have um, the types of um, disparities that we have across the state and especially in a time when we need to connect with each other so much. This is the true heart of the work that we do at Rights and Democracy is to connect on a neighbor to neighbor community to community basis to build this powerful movement. So I want to thank you so so much for that um, and I do want to offer the mic to Dave Kilpatrick who's also going to share some thoughts and important um, some important information that I hope you all will uh, take close attention to. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, and indeed, um, uh, thanks to uh, tonight's speakers, uh, all of you for attending, of course, um, and really uh, to, to you folks for, for caring, for, for showing up and doing this. And that's really uh, what, uh, what it's all about. This is what brings us here. We, we care. Um, um, we're... I'm Dave Kirkpatrick. I serve on the Rights and Democracy Institute board. Um, and we're, we're also here because we understand that change is so badly needed right now and that we are the ones that uh, have to make that happen. Uh, what happens next uh, is, not, is up to all of us. Uh, we see the sign uh, and I really hope it is all of us that end up contributing uh, and helping in some way. Um, and so many of the gains that we've made recently uh, that have come at a cost um, through diligent uh, and persistent efforts uh, are very fragile. We can't afford to, to let our guard down. Uh, we need to keep up the momentum that we have um, and that we've built. And um, we need to keep working on messaging and outreach and you know, reaching out to our representatives, uh, to our lawmakers, uh, reaching out to law enforcement, um, our teachers even, our judges. I mean, these are people are our neighbors, the people we see walking down the street. Um, and to do this, we need organizations like RAD. Uh, the, the vehicle, the tool, if you will, that brings us together, um, gets us up and out in the streets and helps us focus our energy and our vision. Uh, we need to know um, that the, we, we know that the powers that oppose us are organized and well-funded and they're not going away. Uh, and we need resources that will allow us to build and maintain an organized and sustained campaign uh, for the things that we know are right uh, and that will serve the many and we need to oppose those who would uh, sacrifice the many for the few. Um, so we very much appreciate your financial contributions um, and we couldn't do what we do without the generous support from our members. Uh, as always, we encourage you to uh, give in whatever way you can, uh, however you can help us. Um, and a, a sustaining or recurring contribution is especially helpful. It helps us plan a little bit better, look into the future, but however you can. Uh, please and thanks, um, you know where to find us. Uh, I, I did put a link to make donations in the chat um, and you can find us of course at rights-democracy.org. Um, and thank you very much. Thanks for coming and thanks for participating. Before you go, everybody like come off mute and give it up for our awardees for Iris and Emma. Y'all are amazing, congratulations. It's like hey, so hey, much love. Hey, 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 hey. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good job, guys. Good job. Thanks, everybody. Thank Thanks, you. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you.